Good morning. I want to welcome you to another session of Coffee with Cleo. I have a wonderful guest today and, and someone that that is near and dear to, to my heart. And I'd like to introduce you to Chicago native author. I call him also a truth teller, storyteller, uh, Russ Bradbury. Russ is a author of, of four books and we're gonna talk about his books. Uh, that is Make It and Take It, a book on the great Nolan Richardson, 40 Minutes of Hell. Also uh, his travels in Ireland and coaching and that's Patty in the hard, on the hardwood, but also another book that I'm gonna hold up and this is a must read book. It's called All the Dreams We've Dreamed. And it's really a story about basketball and the violence in Chicago on the west side of the city. Uh, and he talks about one of his former players, Sean Harrington. But that being said, he's also a professor of English at New Mexico State University. And I want to welcome everybody to introduce you to my friend and author, Russ Bradford. How are you doing, Russ? Good. It's, it's good to be here, Cleo. Thank you for having me. You know, Russ, one of the things I want to talk to you about, and I'm also going to talk, show the, the other book, and this is a great book, by the way, 40 Minutes of Hell, The Extraordinary Life of Nolan Richardson. I mean, here Russ is, Russ is a coach, he's an author, and also a teacher. And the books that I want to speak about is 40 Minutes of Hell and All the Dreams We Dreamed Before, they're about basketball. But, but Russ, what you don't do, you don't shy away from some of the grittier issues and the real issues that we all face, such as gun violence, social injustice, again, access to healthcare, which basically is a, a big issue in this particular society, especially with today's pandemic. But tell me, why are these things important to you? And what are some of your feelings about them that you speak about in your book? Well, after many years in the game of basketball, Cleo, I, I think that, uh, in retrospect now, looking back at my many years in, in basketball as a, you know, as a terrible player, but, a, you know, as a college coach, I think what interested me most about the game wasn't the offenses and defenses and the X and O's. I, I got bored with that pretty quickly. I think what, in you know, looking back, that was most interesting to me was the stories behind it. Uh, you know, the, the ups and downs and the personal stories, but also I think for many of us as, you know, as a, as a white American, what really interested me more than the stories was the, a window into African American culture. And I think, you know, when, I know when we went to Von Steuben High School, you know, we, I was exposed to, you know, I, there were, there were black kids at my church, but, but none in my, none in my grade school. And when I got to Von Steuben, it was, you know, suddenly I was surrounded with really interesting and fun and smart kids. And that really got my attention. And at that time, it was, of course, the tail end of the civil rights movement, you know, civil rights movement that's ongoing today. But what they were calling the civil rights movement, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s. And so I think that that uh, that basketball was a window into this culture. And so what's always interested me more than the actual games is the stories and struggles behind it. So in my books, there's very little, there's very little of uh, actually on the court stuff that read to me like sports writing. But I, uh, but I think that the, uh, it was the struggles of the people involved and particularly the racial struggle for racial justice and social justice uh, were what really captured my attention. You know, I think it's what you talk about is, is, is pretty key. And this book right here, 40 Minutes of Hell, The Extraordinary Life of Nolan Richardson, you talk about a legendary Hall of Fame coach. You were assistant coach. Nolan is the first coach that ever won the NIT, National Junior College Association uh, Championship, as well as NCAA. But your book really gets into the meat and to the trials and the challenges that he had with racism. Tell me a little bit about your time with Coach Richardson and some of his some of his challenges, but more importantly, how has it impacted you in your life, especially with well, coaching? Well, I think you know Nolan is from what would Nolan would be probably I guess let's see he would be maybe uh, he's nearly eighty years old, and so there, I think there's men alive still from that generation and women, but men and women alive from that generation that really experienced racism firsthand in a way that I think one of the things you know America has a very short memory. And I think that one of the things that happens is people say, well, you know, slavery was 1865, it ended, and what's the, what's the problem? But in examining Nolan's life, you know, you start to see that uh, the struggles that were, you know, very much part of his daily life. A good example is he wanted to be a college coach, but at the time he began his coaching career, there wasn't a single black 
coach at a major college in America. Now think about that. Like who's going to be your role model when you start out as a, as a, as a lowly high school coach. And we both know that, you know, high school coaches are often as good or better coaches than college coaches, but Nolan wanted to be a college coach and there's no role models to do it. And so he had to be, he had to be a trailblazer to do it. And I think one of the things that happened to Nolan, he grew up in Texas, you know, in El Paso, but he grew up more or less thinking he was Mexican. He grew up a Spanish speaker, lived in the barrio, was the first uh, African-American kid at, at the all Mexican-American Bowie High School. And I think it wasn't until he got to college and uh, saw that, you know, he wasn't allowed to travel with the team at first before Don Haskins took over. And I think a, a, it's a lifetime of struggles that in some ways, that, you know, that really angered him. And so at first I started out the book, when I started writing that book, I thought, I'm going to expose Nolan Richardson as this boy who cried wolf. Like he's complaining about racism, but he's making a million dollars a year. You can't do, you can't do that. But once I really dug into his story, I realized you know, he's right about just about everything he says. And it's, I think it's easy for us to say, well, you should just get over all the racism that happened to you for the first 50 years of your life. And people get over it in their, in their own way. But I think what happened with Nolan, as it did, I think with you as a player is sometimes it can be a negative motivation that motivates you. And I think with Nolan, he wanted to prove, you know, that he was going to knock down these doors. And he had, a, I think, a very different sense of history. He was raised by his grandmother, who had been raised by slaves, but had been raised by freed slaves. And so he had a real sense of history and a sense of justice that, uh, that was really a, quite a shock to me to discover. You know, I, I think Nolan Richardson, is, uh, his story is amazing. And quite frankly, as much credit that he has received, I don't think that he's received enough. Uh, big time trailblazer, and your book really gets into it. And it's some, something I think people should really basically take a chance and take a chance to educate themselves on Nolan Richardson and again, the things that he's done. But I, I want to transition because here you talk about a great coach and we're also going to talk about Lou Henson. You, you've coached uh, with the best, the great, late and great and, and rest in peace, Lou Henson, as well as Nolan Richardson. But in this book, all the dreams we've dreamed, um, here you're talking about gun violence in Chicago and also a former player of yours, Sean Harrington. Tell me a little bit about some of the insights in that book and the motivation as well. Well, what, you know, Sean played for us at New Mexico State for a year, and we wound up uh, getting rid of him because he was hurt, which is, which is common in college basketball. What's uncommon is he was the leading scorer and led the team in steals and assists and was a great kid. And so I've always had great, I had great remorse about what had happened to him, but I hadn't, didn't talk to him for, you know, many years because of the, you know, I was just, I had decided to become a writer and wasn't involved in the game so much. But once I heard about him getting shot, I reached out to him. And I think just like it did with basketball, I think that what happened to Sean has been a window into what people on the West side, you know, I know you grew up with it too. I think it's probably worse now. I'm not sure, but I think it's probably worse now. But I, I think for, you know, for many years, I think basketball players got this pass, what uh, Bryant Gumbel called it the Hooper's pass, where if you were a ball player, everyone left you alone. But those days are over, that the old rules are over, the old social order is over, and things have got, and, and there's more and more guns and, and more and more teenagers with guns. And so I wanted to, to bring readers into, a, uh, I think most readers want to go into an area that they don't know. They don't want to read about everything they already knew. And I wanted to take readers into an area to show them, here's what it's like to be around it every day. And most readers will know that, uh, you know, Sean's high school was Marshall High School, which is the high school from Hoop Dreams. And uh, so most, most people, many people know the movie Hoop Dreams, which still holds up. It's a great film. But I wanted to take, uh, you know, take them into sort of the, the side of Chicago and a side of basketball that they weren't seeing, that there's now players getting killed. And once once I told Sean, you know, once I started researching Sean's story where he's, he's paralyzed from a mistaken identity, 7.30 a.m. shooting, where he saved his daughter's life, soon after that, his players at Marshall started getting killed. And would you believe, Cleo, a lot of people don't know this, but Patrick Beverly, you know, the, who's a Marshall player now that's on the uh, yes. L.A. Clippers, he just left the bubble, of the NBA bubble. He said, oh, I've got personal family issues that was another player that got killed. It was his high school teammate from Marshall got killed. The, na it, the name hasn't been released publicly, 
and he hasn't commented on it publicly, but this is an ongoing situation in Chicago where it's, you know, most of us, if it happens, it, it's not just a West Side problem. It can happen in Columbine. It can happen at Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas. It happens at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary. But this is for, I think for, for most, you know, for most middle-class white people, it's once in, once in, a, in a lifetime that it happens. But for these kids in Chicago, it's happening every day. It's a sl slower attrition. It's maybe not as dramatic, but I wanted to show what it was like to live every day. And also the struggles that Sean has had to go through for health care and jobs and respect since its shooting seemed important stories to me. You know, I, I, think it, I think there are great stories because as you know, the perfect storm with the pandemic, rising unemployment, uh, COVID-19 has affected everyone in many different ways globally. We talk about also access to healthcare, which is driven by employment the social justice issues that from anywhere from George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, we can go on and on. But what is impressive about your books, and as we see these things being more or less talked about cross-generational, across the globe, you were discussing this before the event. Well, I, and I do think, I, I think that's right. This is all, this all happened. Uh, you know, the timing of the book uh, was, was a little bit different. The book came out a few years before George Floyd. But one of the things I think that happens is this idea of blaming the victim. That's a common thing that uh, I learned at North Park College in my social psychology class. But people talk about it all the time. Like, what, what did she go to that party for wearing a dress if she didn't want to get raped? You know, that kind of idea. And with, with, even with George Floyd, you know, who's the Houston native, they'll say, well, he'd been arrested before. And those kinds of, well, with Sean Harrington, he, you know, Sean had uh, he'd graduated from college, was a great father to his daughters, had come back to Marshall High School where he'd attended to try to make a difference. It was, it was 7.30 in the morning. It wasn't like he was at a you know, at a nightclub at three in the morning, you know, or that kind of thing. And so one of the things that the Sean Harrington thing really demonstrated to many of us is that you can do everything right in America and still get, and still get shot and, and, and have your life ruined. And it was, it was only when the, uh, his health care got cut and he lost his job and those kinds of things It really exposed, it, it sort of drove me crazy, Cleo, because I thought, here's a guy that's an American hero and he's now jobless without without health insurance and it just i just thought if this was any other country developed developed country in the world we would have a great safety net and so now i, I just became determined not to let uh i wanted it to, to be uh, bigger than what it was i wanted i didn't want that great act of heroism where he saved his daughter's life and dove on top of her i didn't want that to be ignored and so um but i also think i, I do think if we're going to study history there's no point in studying Martin Luther King without saying, what would I have done if Martin Luther King was marching through my neighborhood? Now, he never marched through my neighborhood in Chicago. He did through yours, I think. But would I have gone out and marched with him? Would I have thrown rocks like some people in Chicago? Or would I have just stayed home and, and turned on the TV and not? And I, I do think that the, the point of studying history is to say to yourself, what would I do? You know, when, you know it, uh, when I, I was a terrible Little League baseball player, as you might guess, but I remember the coach saying to me, now, Russ, when you're in right field, don't be looking up at the sky. You've got to think, what am I going to do if the ball is hit to me? You know, so I thought, okay, what am I going to do if it hits to me? I guess I'll throw it to second, second base. Well, I think it's the, the whole point of studying George Floyd and Mark Luther King and, and Malcolm X and, and all the great, you know, uh, contributors in history – what would I have done? Would I have had the courage? Would I have had the courage to, you know, get, take a knee like Colin Kaepernick, or would I have? Would I have not? And what would have been my, you know? Uh, and I think there's courageous people who don't take a knee. I believe that. But what would? I, there's no point in looking at history or reading somebody's story. I think without thinking, what would I have done? And I, I think Sean's courage, Sean Harrington's courage and endurance, have, you know, really shamed a lot of us. You know, the thing you talked about is what would I've done? I think there's people that bring a, a problem to, to uh, every solution and folks that bring a solution to every problem. Then there's people that <laughs> like to look on, that stand on the sidelines and, and, and really not engage. But I think we're living in a great time where we have seen an unparalleled level of engagement, again, that is cross-generational, that is multi-ethnic, but yet and still, we're at an inflection point where we need to decide what are we going to do, and I think it's time. And I want to commend you for the books that you're writing and the stories that you're telling. But just a couple more questions for you, Russ. I'm, I'm just typing. I'm not really doing anything that important, but go ahead. You know, 
just getting ready for our interview today, I, I looked up the uh, definition of coaching. And, you know, my, my book, Coffee with Cleo, is a self-help, self-development book, a leadership book and on my lessons of leadership. But coaching is part of leadership as well. And let me just read this to you because I, I want to get your perspective. It says a coach is someone who trains a person or team of people in a particular sport. Now, I feel that's very restrictive. It also says they're responsible for training athletes by analyzing their performance, instructing the relevant skills, and providing encouragement. I don't think that's really indicative of what a coach does, but when I see what you're doing, and as a former coach, but you're still a coach, some of the reactions of what you've done with your book with the coach, Coach Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich, who are speaking out, what do you feel a role of a coach is today, specifically, not just for their teams, but in society? Well, I, I, you know, I, I was a great admirer of, of Phil Jackson. And I think that, I think he was really onto something that it's bigger than the game. And by, by having his players be well-read and thinking about social issues and spiritual issues, that, uh, that that would actually make them better players, that it wasn't taking away from, you know, when I first started coaching, I, I already had hobbies and I was interested in music and books and, and movies, but I didn't want my players to have any hobbies. I wanted my players to, you know, uh, you know, I wanted my players, you know, Tim Hardaway was very, who I coached at, at Texas El Paso. He would go home at the end of practice and watch the games on ESPN all night and copy the crossover dribble. And, the, and, 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 and I used to think that was the only model, but I do think that it's by, I think by broadening our understanding of life whether it's spiritual or educational or social, that by broadening your understanding of life, it actually makes you a better player. It doesn't take away from the game because you can't practice your crossover dribble for 14 hours a day, regardless of what Tim Hardaway used to think. And I, I think by educating ourselves and, and being interested in other issues, it makes us more receptive. And I think I, I want players to be, you know, I want players to react maturely in the games. And one of the ways to have more mature players is to broaden their horizons and have them, have them understand that basketball is an important game, but it's just a tool that we're using for this other understanding. Absolutely. Last question, Russ. Uh, in your book, again, I'm, I'm going to promote your book because uh, personally, uh, I think it's a good one. Again, all the dreams we dream. And that's, again, a story of hoops and handguns on Chicago's West Side, where I grew up, by Russ Bradford. Russ, I was recruited twice, uh, recruited out of high school, and then recruited again. I went to junior college, placed there by University of Iowa, and then had to go through recruiting again. The recruiting game, I know, has changed, but yet and still, some things are the same. And in your book, this book specifically, you talked about some of the aspects of recruiting where you're brutally honest and candid of dream selling. And my question to you is this, you went back after you coached Sean to help him to this day. I don't know if a lot of coaches do that, but I wanna ask you with this whole process of dream selling and going back, what made you go back and how do you feel about dream selling? Well, I, th I think, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a peculiar business in that, you know, I think the only other business that depends on uh, the decisions of black teenagers besides, you know, college sports might be, you know, might be music or shoe culture. I think, I think that there's, there's a uh, uh, music and shoe culture are greatly interested by young African-American uh, men. But I think in the case of Sean Harrington, it was, you know, it was sort of my way of, a t I think I did some good things as a coach. I'm not trying to be uh, falsely modest, but I, I do think that there's a certain damage that this idea of selling dreams, like this is actually going to lead to something for you, that if it doesn't lead to a degree and a better way of life, I don't understand what the point is. And so I, I do think that with Sean, he was a special kid. And we could tell that even from, uh, even during his short time at New Mexico State, you know, he was really loved and respected. There's other players, frankly, Cleo, that I, if, the, if I see their, you know, the number comes in on their phone, I think, uh, I'm just, I don't have time to talk to that guy. I can't help every kid. But I do think that for all of us, maybe the message might be find somebody worth helping and, and help that, you know, and help that person, no matter how, you know, how down. And I think by, by helping Sean, I hate to say it, it sounds terrible to say, but Sean Harrington being shot has really lifted up 
hundreds and hundreds of people, not just the people who've read the book, but the people who've come in contact with him and his own daughter, his own families, and, and those of us that have come in contact with him, like, it's been a positive in my life. I know it sounds terrible to say, but, you know, it really shamed me as to, you know, how easy and simple my life is. And I think that people that read the book will come to realize, I mean, in many ways, it's a book about redemption and faith, even though it's not the happiest book in the world. Well, I think stories, you know, we all have stories to tell and some stories need to be told, but more importantly, some stories need to be heard. And that's a story that I feel needs to be heard from many people that could benefit from it. Last right. thing, Russ, uh, as a leader or for anyone that's aspiring to be a leader or a coach, one or two things that you've learned from the late, great Lou Henson, also from Nolan Richardson, as well as Sean Harrington. Are there two particular attributes or traits or lessons that you can share with uh, the audience that's listening today? I'm, I'm not the most religious guy in the world, Cleo, but I think for all of those, all, all, all of those guys, particularly Lou Henson and Sean Harrington, um, and Nolan too, is that they were willing to, they, you know, they, they were willing to make big sacrifices for Sean who was diving on top of his daughter. But I think, I think there's, a, there's a Christian element to uh, taking care of the downtrodden and, and, and the way you speak to people that have far less power than you. Like, I will never forget with Lou Henson and how kind he was to the waitress and the janitor and the secretaries. Like, he didn't hold himself above anybody. And there's this sort of idea of, uh, you know, of, of servitude that, that Sean and, and Lou Henson, I think, embodied. And Lou, Lou never coached Sean Harrington, but they became good friends before Lou died. And, and so I think it's that element of servitude. It is, I do think that the great leaders are, you know, uh, the great leaders are listeners that are willing to, and willing to not hold themselves above people, but to listen to the people below them. And I think Sean and Lou Henson did that. And it's something that, frankly, I'm still working on, you know, and, and as a coach, we all, we all do that where the seven footer comes in your office. And you're like, yeah, come on, sit down. But then the five ten, you know, the five ten guy who's the bench warmer, you're like, I, I, I don't have time today. I, I don't, you're going to come back later. And I do think, you know, with Lou, he treated everybody like they were royalty. And, and, and I think that Sean, Sean in a different way has done that where everyone who comes around Sean is uplifted. And I think that's our, that's our charge as coaches and humans. Yeah. Russ, I want to, Thank you very much for spending time with me with Coffee with Cleo, uh, what you had to say and what you shared with everybody. And you've done it in only the way that Russ Sweet Lou Bradberg would do, very honestly, candidly, and with no abatement, with no filter. So uh, thanks for giving us the straight truth and all the best. And we look forward to uh, having more Coffee with Cleo. Thank you, thanks Russ. So Thank you.